Now, as this course will focus heavily on the science of health, it makes sense to start with a definition of science that is easy to understand. So this is my definition of science. Science is logic backed up by evidence. Now, when I say logic, I just mean common sense. Simple common sense, like two plus two. If I was to say to you, two plus two, what's two plus two, what would you say? Four. Your common sense should say four. That's logic. But then what if I said prove it? Then you'd have to show evidence. You'd have to back it up with evidence. The easiest way to show evidence is just put two fingers on one hand, two fingers on the other hand, and count them out loud. There's your evidence. So science to me is just common sense, and then you back it up with proof. And when I go with my own definition of science, I started to realize that science is simple, which is interesting, because when I do go into the schools and I, I'm teaching the children about health and childhood obesity and that sort of stuff, I always ask them, what's your favorite subject? And none of them say science. For whatever reason, they, science, they find science very confusing. So they never say science is their favorite subject, whether it's physics, maths, um, biology, chemistry. But I like to keep things very simple because a wise man once said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. That was arguably the greatest scientist of all time, Albert Einstein. So if he can keep it simple, why can't we? Now, many people find science very confusing. Now, I have found through my own observation that confusion leads to conflict and conflict always leads to pain. So I've written it on the board there, confusion leads to conflict, conflict leads to pain. That conflict can be internal and or external. So if you're confused about something, it could lead to internal conflict. Let's go back to the kids, the children in school. If they're confused about physics, it could lead to some mental pain. In other words, they're like, oh, I can't get it. I don't know why physics is so hard. And that leads to internal conflict, which will lead to pain. What about external conflict? External conflict, let's say they're in a relationship with someone or they've, they've got a friend and their friend says or does something that is confusing, that might lead to external conflict. You're now in conflict with someone else, yeah? And that's gonna lead to pain. So I've found through my observations that confusion always leads to conflict and conflict leads to pain. So anytime we're talking about science or any subject, what do we need? We need total clarity on the situation because I have found through my observations that clarity leads to harmony and harmony leads to peace or pleasure or heart or love, balance. So we want peace, we don't want pain. So when it comes to studying science, to me, studying science is just studying the universe. Now I've put this in your notes. If you turn to page two, after it gives my definition of science, it says studying science is simply studying the universe and everything in it. As you are part of the universe, this means by studying the universe, you'll undoubtedly be studying yourself. So when I'm studying the universe, because I'm part of it, there's no doubt that I'll end up studying myself. So to me, science is nothing but studying the universe. And what I've found by studying the universe is that the universe is electromagnetic. And that's in your notes as well. The universe is electromagnetic. Now, what does that mean? Well, a famous guy once said this about electricity. Electrical, how does that come in with our understanding. Are we electrical people? If I want to change, and many people out here want to change how they're living against nature and become in balance with nature, what, what would we do? Electric food. You ask if we are electrical. Mm -hmm. If we were not electrical, if we weren't electrical, we would not be able to move. Mm -hmm. Just by the movement of our heart, the palpitation of the heart, which is 6,000 pounds per square inch pressure, push it again. What moved the heart? There could be no movement unless that movement is electrical. So the food should be electrical, which is nutrition. All right, so he says the food should be electrical and we are electric beings. And he says, without electricity, we would not be able to move. So if the universe is electromagnetic and we're part of the universe, we're living organisms inside of the universe, that means we are electromagnetic as well. Now, what does that mean? Well, electricity, and this is in your notes, electricity is the flow of electrons. 
the flow of electrons. That's all you need to know for now with regards to electricity. So the easiest way to think about an electron is like it's bioinformation. So electricity is the flow of information and magnetism is the storage of that information. So electricity is the flow of electrons and magnetism is the story of storage of electrons, yeah? So this is his famous quote, the body is electric. And we understand electromagnetism and we don't even realize it because how many of us have a smartphone? Hands up, smartphone, every single one of us. So the fact that you've got a smartphone, you understand electromagnetism because you know that your phone is powered by electricity, yeah? You know that the laptop is powered by electricity. These lights are powered by electricity, yeah? With your phone, there's a magnet inside of the phone that stores the information. So that's electromagnetism. Electricity moves things or powers things and magnets store things. That's the same in your phone. In your laptop, there's a magnet that stores the information. In, uh, on a credit card, if you was to get your credit card and look at the back of your credit card, there's a black strip that goes on the back of the credit card. That is the magnet that stores the information. On an airplane, there's a black box on an airplane that stores the information, but it's electricity that makes the plane fly. So electromagnetism pretty much runs everything that we see around us, electromagnetism. Now, having a phone, you'll start to understand certain things come with electromagnetism. So with electricity, you now know comes magnetism. They're one and the same. You can't have one without the other. Anytime there's a flow of electrons, there's gonna be a magnetic field that gets generated around it. But what else comes with electricity? Well, just by looking at your phone, what else can your phone do? It lights up and it heats up. Okay, so with electricity comes light. Anytime there's electricity, there's gonna be light, even if you can't see it. So with electricity comes light. And the sis says it heats up as well. So with electricity comes heat as well. So if you use your phone or your laptop for a long time, it starts to heat up. So all of these things are synonymous with each other. Electricity, light, heat, magnetism. What else can my phone do? If someone rings me, it might vibrate. vibrate. So with electricity comes vibrations as well. Now, if you hear those vibrations, you'll hear them as sound. So with electricity comes light, heat, sound, magnetism, and vibrations, yeah? They all come together. And you understand that just from having a smartphone. But what Dr. Sebi said is the body's electric. So that means that everything that your phone can do, you can do, or your cells. There was, it was actually a, a black guy that made the, the cell phone. I wonder if he based it off of our own cells. Interesting. So when it comes on to electricity, if I'm explaining it to children, I like to use children's um, websites. Because I feel like if I use a, a child's website, they should be able to explain electricity in a very simplified way. So this is from BBC Bite Size. So this is aimed at children. It says, what is electricity? Electricity is the presence or flow of charged particles. An electric current is the flow of electrons. So that's what electricity is, the flow of electrons, yeah? And this is an atom. To understand what an electron is, we have to go all the way back to physics at school. So this is an atom, the smallest unit of matter that exists in the universe, yeah? And you've got in the middle, you've got the nucleus that consists of the protons and the neutrons. And then whizzing round the outside, you've got what they call the electrons, yeah? This is the smallest unit. These atoms come together to form molecules. Molecules come together to form your cells. Your cells come together to form your tissues. Tissues form organs. So this is the smallest part we're looking at. So these electrons, it's the flow of these guys that creates electricity. So if they're just whizzing around one atom, that's not electricity. It's when they go from one atom to another, when they start to actually move, that becomes electricity. And according to most scientists, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is all of the electromagnetic radiation in the universe. Now, you might remember this from school if you were staying awake because a lot of us didn't like science at school. But this is all of the radiation. I remember with electricity comes light. So this is all of the light in the universe as well. Now, I find this interesting because if you look at the whole spectrum, there's only a tiny part of the spectrum 
which is what they call visible light. Only a very, very tiny part of the whole spectrum. This is all of the light in the universe, yeah? But it's only this tiny part, which is visible light, which is what your eye can see, your naked eye can see, yeah? So any color that we see around us, we're seeing just this tiny portion of the spectrum and then everything else is light that we can't see. So cosmic rays, gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, these are all radiation. But remember, anytime there's electricity, there's light, there's heat, there's magnetism. So there's light here as well. Now, if this, if this is true, then most of the universe, most of the universe is what color? Black. 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 Most of the universe is black or black light, you, sh you could say, because this is light. It's, it's, not, it's not darkness, because it's not absent of light. So most of the universe is black, black light. And again, everything that you see there is how they power up your phone, yeah? So light becomes important, because that's what we're gonna be talking about if we're talking about electromagnetism. We're talking about light, and the only light that we can see is in this visible spectrum, which creates color. So anytime we see color, it's representing a vibrational frequency. Anytime we see color, it represents a vibrational frequency, which means that colors become extremely important in understanding science. Because a certain color will say how, um, how high the frequency is or how low the frequency is. These are higher frequencies, these are lower frequencies. So colors become important. Now, with that being said, we're going to start with an icebreaker. So you should all have a red, amber, green card in front of you. Red, amber, green. So we're going to go through colors right now. All right. Now, because a lot of people, when we start talking about health, has everyone got a card? If you haven't got a card, there's cards at the back. Everyone's got one. All right. Because every time we start talking about health, people go straight to nutrition. Like, what should we eat? What shouldn't we eat? Nutrition is just one part of health, yeah? So holistic health. Actually, before we go on to that, just very quickly, if I was to ask you, what does holistic mean? What would you say? Holy. Whole? Holy. Holy. Pure. Natural. Pure. Raw. Raw. Was that generic? Generic. Complete. Complete. Untainted. Untainted. <clears throat> Balance. Let's put that one here. All right. So if we're talking about health, we can't just be talking about nutrition because that wouldn't be balanced. However, a lot of people, when they think of health, they think of nutrition. So let's start with an icebreaker. And that icebreaker is, if you were to put all foods on a traffic light system, red, amber, green, what would red foods be and why? Toxic foods. All right, to make it easier, what would red foods be high in? Sugar, sugar fat, salt. All right, so red foods high in sugar, fat, salt, yeah? Now. I do this with the children, by the way. This is a very simple icebreaker. If we was to put all foods on this red, amber, green system, how frequently should we be eating green foods? Every day. Every day, yeah? How frequently should we be eating red foods? None at all. None at all? Not at all. All right, now this is the reason why I like doing this with children, because children, they, they use logic. They're very simple with their, how they think. If we was to say to children, don't eat something, like ban it, is, is that realistic for them? Yeah. All right, so I always ask the children, per week, like frequency per week, how often should you be eating red foods? What do you reckon? Once? Okay. Once, sometimes the children say once or twice. All right. How often frequency per week should the green foods be? Every day. Every day. What about amber? Two or three days. All right. Here's what we say when we do it in the schools. So red is once or twice a week. Green is unlimited. 
Green is unlimited. There's no limit on how much you can eat. In other words, you can eat in the morning, afternoon, evening. There's no limit to green. However, amber, amber, there's a limit. Amber, if you've eaten it that day, you shouldn't really eat it again that day. So you could potentially end up eating it like four or five times a week. But if you've eaten it that day, you shouldn't really eat it again that day. So it might end up being three times, four times a week. All right. With that being said, I'm going to show you some food examples and all you're going to do is hold up red, amber or green. So let's see. Now, if we're all in agreement, then we'll move on. If not, we might have to discuss it a little bit. All right, first one. A wide variety of fruits. Hold it up so I can see it. Green, everyone's saying green. We've got a red there for fruits. Fruits, red. Anyone want a red? Oh, amber. All right, why do you think it's an amber? Okay. All right. Now, again, when it comes to um, learning about health and nutrition, because there's so much confusing information out there, we have to try and keep it as super simple as possible. So when I go into the schools and I show children this, what do you think they show? What do you think they say? Green. green. Now, if I was to turn around to them and say, this is an amber, they'd probably think, then what's a green? If fruits are an amber, what is a green? Like it limits the greens that we have out there, yeah? And again, we live in, a, um, in the UK, there, we have a problem with childhood obesity. Now there is a, a lot of sugar, but the point here is there's a wide variety of fruits. So you never want children or adults just eating one fruit all throughout the day. But a wide variety of fruits, you're getting a lot of vitamins, minerals, and yeah, children are not, they're hardly eating any fruits and vegetables, let alone making this an amber. All right, next one. Crisps. Red, amber, or green? Red. Red. People thinking about it. You can be honest, don't worry about it. Judgment-free zone right now. Okay. All right, red, some ambers. Okay. What about popcorn? Red. Red. People thinking about it. Red. Again, I'd like to do this with the children. Where would children be getting their popcorn from? Parents, microwave. Where are they usually getting popcorn from? Cinema. Cinema. What's that going to be? Red, amber, or green? Red. 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 All right. What about chips? Red. Red. All right. What about baked potato? Uh, amber. 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 Okay. People are saying amber, putting up ambers. All right. Now, this could potentially be made into a red. How? What you're putting on top of it, more cheese, yeah. What topping and that sort of stuff, okay. What about vegetables? Green. Green. Everyone says green. All right. What about pizza? Red. Again, you can be honest, this is a judgment free zone. Yeah. Cheese alone is fat meat. Okay. <laughs> what about this? Red. Amber. Seeing a lot of reds. Seeing a lot of reds. Couple ambers. Reds, ambers. Okay. So, you've got to be careful with this because, yeah, there's not a lot of cheese, but what's this made of? Yeah. yeah. Now, this could be made healthier, depending on what type of pasta you use, yeah? Or spaghetti you use, like spelt spaghetti, we're gonna talk about that later on in the course, and what type of sauce. But obviously, as it is, some, most of you said amber or red. What about this? Fried chicken. Red. Now, again, I like to do this in the schools. So when I go into the schools and I do this, what do you think the children say? Again, the children are very logical. The children say red. But how do they eat it? They eat it like you say, green. They eat it every day, yeah? So they know they shouldn't be eating it every day. They say red, when I show this, they say red. They understand, but they eat it every day. Every day after school, children are in the fried chicken shop eating this. So they know, that's interesting. They know that it's a red, but they eat it like a green. What about this? Some amber, some red. What about red meat? Red, red. red. yeah, studies have suggested that this is carcinogenic, so causes cancer. What about fizzy drinks? What about energy drinks? 
Red, everyone's saying red, yeah? It's giving you energy, yeah. All right, what about chocolate? What kind? Yeah. It's always interesting. When I do it with the children, they'll just say, yeah, red, but adults, what kind? What kind are we talking about? Because if it's dark, you know, if it's dark. All right, well, let's start with milk chocolate. If it's milk chocolate, what is it? Red. Red. Everyone agree? Now, why is, why is it a red if it's milk chocolate? Because it's high in sugar, sugar. sugar. And, dairy. and dairy. All right. So dark chocolate, what would you say that is? Amber. Amber. Okay. What makes the dark chocolate healthier? It's got something natural. It's got na something natural. Some people say, yeah, it's got, I've heard it's got antioxidants. And <laughs> so it's things that you're hearing, yeah? However, what you'll find is that milk chocolate is high in sugar. But remember, you, you guys said that a red is something that's high in what? Sugar or salt, salt or fat. Dark chocolate is high in fat. Dark chocolate is high in saturated fat, yeah? But it does have... Because of what it's made of, it does have antioxidants in it as well. So that's what gives it the quote unquote health factor. Yeah. But dark chocolate is high in fat. So you've got one that's high in sugar and the other one that's high in fat. So if we're going by just the definition of the red, which is something that's high in fat and or sugar, then they would both be a red. What about this, which is sandwiches that people get when on their way to work or at lunchtime and that sort of stuff. Most people saying red. Okay. What about water? Green? Okay. Depends where you're getting it from. All right, we're going to go through water later on in the course. Alcohol? Red. Red, everyone agree? I know some were like, no, not, not red. Not red, come on. Not my alcohol. What about milk? Red. Everyone's saying red. Some people putting up amber. Cow's milk. Definitely red. Okay. What about eggs? Amber. Some people say amber. A lot of people saying red. What? Ah, so we went through this. Fruit juice. Red. Fruit juice. What about cut up fruits? You know, you'll find these in Tesco's and Sainsbury's ready made cut up fruits. Amber. 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 You've got to be, there's been studies to suggest that because of the utensils that they use to cut it up, it could be contaminated. And you don't know how long it's been on the shelf as well. So that could, that makes it a red, yeah? They usually put something on it as well, yeah. And then what about this one, coffee? Red, amber, okay. Okay, again, when I do this with adults, they'll say it depends and that sort of stuff. But adults who drink coffee, how often do they drink it? Sometimes three times a day. So for the adults, this is a green. The adults who drink coffee, this is a green for you. You drink it like a green, yeah? But it's not. Should actually be a red. Now, when I show this to the children, what do you reckon they say? They say, what is that? Because remember, they're not at that stage where they have to rely on this to get up and keep them up all day, yeah? They're like, what drink is that? Because they don't drink coffee, yeah? Now, I always do this in the schools, colleges, and universities, and I get the same result. The children say... They put up the greens for the greens, the ambers for the ambers, and the reds for the reds. In other words, we know what we should be eating and what we shouldn't be eating. So I have a question. Why do we tend to eat more red foods than green foods? All right, more addictive. All right, let's write these down. Let's write these down. So someone said, Addictive. What else? Attractive. Convenient. Attractive. Convenient. Um, marketing. Advertising. What was the other ones? Misinformation. Misinformation. Feels good. Yeah. yeah. Feels good. 
misinformation availability what else stress, stress. budget, budget. Comfort. Anything else? Cycles. That's to do with emotions. Tradition. Tradition. Anything else? Sorry, what was that? Environment, yeah. All right, one more. Make you look attractive. Yeah, attractive. Yeah, that's part of marketing, so. All right. So why do we tend to eat more red foods than green foods? Now, here's where I'm going to introduce to you a scientific um, theory. So this is on page three of your notes. The pleasure principle, Freud, this is from Sigmund Freud, so one of the famous psychologists, one of the famous um, scientists. Freudian psychology described the pleasure principle of human motivation. It said that people are motivated towards pleasure and away from pain. Hence, it is also sometimes called the pleasure pain principle. In other words, he said he broke down everyone's motivation, human motivation down to two motivating factors, pleasure and pain. If you were to break down everything that a human does, it's due to one of these two things. It's either to seek pleasure or to avoid pain. Think about everything that you do in life. If you were to break down what you're doing, it's to seek pleasure or to avoid pain. Even going to work. If you're going to work, the reason why you are going to work is to do one of two things. Either seek pleasure, it might be the money you're making, that's pleasurable, or to avoid pain. You want to make sure that you're paying your bills and you don't get you know, evicted from your house or whatever. So everything that a human being does, it can be broken down to these two motivations, pleasure and pain, either seeking pleasure or avoiding pain. Now, here's a question. Which one do you think is more powerful as a motivating factor? Pleasure. 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 Hands up who thinks pleasure. Interesting. Who thinks pain? Interesting. All right, so here's another question. So pleasure pain principle, does this, is this the reason why we're going through childhood obesity? So is this the main cause of obesity, pleasure pain? So if we go back to the red, amber, green, the red foods are pleasurable for most people. Like someone said there, it feels good. Feels good eating those foods, yeah? So the red foods are pleasurable. And again, the easiest way to understand this is thinking about children. They find pleasure in eating the red foods and they actually find pain in eating the green foods. Literally, because we like to think that pain is just physical. Pain is not just physical. Pain can be emotional. Pain can be mental. Pain can be psychological. Pain can be spiritual. And pain can be you tasting something and finding it disgusting. That's a painful experience for a child. So if you say, eat this broccoli to the child, and the child eats the broccoli and they're like, ah, that's disgusting. That's now registered as a painful experience to the child. So if that's the case, they find the green foods, the foods that are good for them, literally green foods like broccoli and all the other green foods, painful and all of this, ple all the sugary stuff and the high fat stuff, pleasurable, yeah? But we can go deeper. Someone said about addiction over there, addictive. If we have to go inside of the brain, we've got these things called neurotransmitters. These are the structure of neurotransmitters. Now, chances are you might not know all of them, but you, you should know some of them. So we've got adrenaline. We know what that feels like when that gets released. Noradrenaline. Serotonin is the mood neurotransmitter that makes us feel good during the day. It gets released during the day. Endorphins, for people who exercise, you know about this neurotransmitter. But look at this one, dopamine. The pleasure neurotransmitter. This get, gets released in the brain after feelings of pleasure. So it's, a, it's associated with addiction. 
but dopamine is also associated with movement and motivation. People repeat behaviors that lead to a dopamine release. So this is very important when it comes to the addiction. And you know what releases dopamine in the brain? Um, heroin, cocaine, and sugar. They release dopamine. They actually activate the same parts of the brain as drugs, sugar, yeah? So the children who say they love it may not even be true. They may not just love the food. They're actually addicted to the food due to these, this neurotransmitter, yeah? Now, when I'm explaining science, I like to break things down very simple and use analogies and that sort of stuff because I feel like, especially when I go and teach science to the children, I want to make sure that they really get it and understand it. Now, through me understanding science, I found that the best way to understand science is to break down the language that they use, yeah? Scientists, they like to use language. They've got like a jargon that they use. And that jargon, everyone, everyone who's a scientist understands it. And if you're not a scientist, you just won't get it, yeah? But it's not just scientists that do that. Every industry has people who are in the know. They have their own jargon. And if you're not in the know, then you're not gonna know what they're talking about. Like two plumbers could be in your house and they're talking to you about your bathroom and you wouldn't have a clue what they're saying. But they're talking in their jargon, their plumber jargon, yeah? And they're not gonna tell you what they say because that's what keeps it powerful. That's what keeps it within the industry. They have their jargon. Electricians, they have their jargon. Doctors have their jargon. And scientists have their jargon. So when you are trying to understand science, it's about understanding the words, understanding the language. And that being said, it's not just scientists and doctors that do this. We do it as well as black people. Our culture, you could argue, is our jargon. Our culture. Two black people could be talking to each other and someone who's not black wouldn't understand what they're saying. <coughs> they're speaking English though. But because we're talking in our culture, in our jargon, people don't understand it. The only way they do is if we tell them. For example, a lot of the young people right now, they're into grime and drill. That's like the most popular music in the UK right now. I'm going to show you a video from a grime artist. His name is So Large. That's his name, So Large, yeah? Now for the people who don't like grime, don't worry, it's only for a minute. But all I want you to do, whilst you're listening to this grime tune, is just tell me what he's saying. Just tell me what he's saying, yeah? All right, so listen carefully. If I have to spend my savings, only the saviour can save you. Yeah, I'm larger than your average. I pay the striker salary. I'll put bread on my beef. Call that a rich boy sandwich. Heavyweight putting on calories. I pay the striker salary. I'll put bread on my beef. Call that a rich boy sandwich. You ain't got ham, you're a has been. You ain't got ham, you're a has been. I'll put bread on my beef. I'll put bread on my beef. Put your money where your mouth is. Come put your money where your mouth is. I'll get bread on the street so I can put bread on my beef. So that was a minute of a gram tune and the guy was speaking English. All I want you to do is tell me, what was he talking about? Putting bread on his beef. What does that mean? Bread? Money. So bread means money. What? Bread means money, yeah? So he says he's going to put bread on his beef He's going to put money on his argument. So bread, so when you listen to it, the bread, when he says bread, it doesn't mean bread, does he? He's not talking about food. Is he talking about food? No. So he says, I'm going to put bread on my, uh, bread on my beef. And then he says, call it a rich boy sandwich. He says, call it a rich boy sandwich. So again, he's not talking about food. So he says bread, beef, and sandwich, and he's not talking about food. Then he says, heavyweight putting on calories. Again, he's not talking about food. So he's saying he's so large because he eats a lot of these rich boy sandwiches. So we need to understand, what's a, what's a rich boy sandwich? So bread on beef. He says if he's got a problem with someone, he'll put his bread on his beef. So bread means money. We all understand that bread means money. And what does beef mean? Argument. Argument. Conflict. Yeah, so confusion leads to conflict. Conflict leads to... He said that he'll put bread on his beef. Call it a rich boy sandwich. And then he said heavyweight putting on calories. Then he said... I pay the strikers' salaries. Is he, is he talking about football? He's talking about a hitman. 
In other words, when he says, I'm putting bread on my beef, he's saying, I'm going to pay someone to kill you. That's what putting bread on my beef means. I'm going to pay someone. In other words, I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to touch you. I, I'm not going to touch you. If you have an issue with me, I'm not going to touch you, but I'm going to put bread on my beef and you're going to get dealt with. I am not going to touch you, but you're going to get dealt with. Yeah? This is why we need to understand language because it's not just them that use it. Our children are using it as well. Ask any child sitting down here what that person just said. They'd tell you everything. But we as adults, we don't know that he's talking about killing people. Yeah? Talking about um, paying someone to kill someone else. That's what he means when he says bread on his beef. And he says, when he says I'm putting on calories, he's saying I'm doing this a lot. I'm paying a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. Like you, could sort of pick up. you can pick it up. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, it's, it's out there. Like when I um, do my hidden science events and courses, I always say the best way to hide the truth is where? In a book. Plain sight. Plain sight. Just out there in plain sight. Yeah. In a book. Book is plain sight as well. Yeah. So plain sight. So you could break that down, but most people, they don't break that down. They'll just watch it and just think, oh, he's chatting foolishness. But he's literally telling you what he's going to do if you have beef with him. Yeah. Now, even though, like, I'm a fan of our culture, whatever culture it is, I'm a fan of our culture. So I'm a fan of our young black boys, yeah? I'm just not a fan of the content, like, the, what they're actually saying. But what he done in this tune, you could argue, is quite genius. Yeah. Yeah. When you listen to it, anyone else listening to it, they'd, they wouldn't know what he's talking about. He's created this language which him and his peers understand. And if you're an outsider, you'll think he's talking about food. And they do this in rap as well. So this is Pusha T. And listen to what Pusha T says. Pusha T, his last album, he made it with Kanye West, yeah? And Kanye West is a bit removed from the streets right now. So, yeah? so <laughs> he said that when he was making the album, he had to continue to explain to Kanye what he meant on the song. So just listen to this. I talk in cryptic code. Some people, it goes right over their heads. A lot of time I'm in there with Ye, and he's like, man, what does that mean? To other people in the street, it's like, oh my God, he's speaking a language, he's speaking directly to me. If you're in touch and in tune with, uh, with the life, then it's gonna mean the world to you. So if you know, you know. If you know, you know. So we do it in hip hop, they do it with science, they do it with doctors. Doctors will be like, if you know, you know. They're not gonna really tell you what's going on with you. If you know, you know. So the easiest way to understand science is break down the language, break down the jargon. And the easiest way to break down language is to go to the etymology of words. Do we all understand what the etymology of word is? Not the definition. The definition of the word is just something that someone defined. A word, let's say a com this word, confusion. Someone defined it and then put it in a book. That's the definition. The etymology of the word is the study of the origin of words and the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. So you're going back because some people, there's more than one definition of certain words. Let's go back to its origin. Where did the word originate from? So when we're talking about this word, addiction, addictive, I did some research and I found that it comes from Latin, addictus or addicti. And do you know that addiction means enslaved? Person enslaved for debt or theft, yeah? Addictus, addicted to, debt, slave, bound, bent upon, person enslaved, enslaved. So that means if you're addicted to something, you're a slave to that thing. You're still a slave. Interesting. This is why I like to break down words and use etymology. Who's this? Harriet Tubman, what was her famous quote? She said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. How many of us, if you were to walk to someone now and say, you know you're a slave to the food that you eat? They'd be like, I'm not a slave. What do you mean I'm a slave? I'm not a slave, yeah? But we are a slave. If we're addicted to red foods, we are a slave to those foods. We're enslaved still to this day. But what else are we addicted to? I don't know. Our phones. So this is making us enslaved as well. This is making us enslaved as well. Our phones, anything you're addicted to, is gonna make you a slave to, because that's what the word actually means, yeah? Now, what about the environment? Someone wrote their environment there. Think about the environment we live in as well. So, what makes us addicted? Well, if you live in an environment where everywhere you go, 
yeah? All you're met with is junk food, junk food, junk food. Think about the children. When I go into the schools, it's funny because when I come out of the school, I look left, I look right, and there's a chicken shop both sides. Like, I'm thinking, why are these chicken shops so close to the schools? Is that by design? Yeah? And like our children, they know these guys. They probably know them by name. Yeah. Boss man, sort me out, man. Boss man, boss man. Yeah? But it's like these guys know, like, they're feeding us poison. Look at their faces. <laughs> they're going to actually eat it. Look at that. But this is the environment, yeah? So we actually live in an environment that promotes an unhealthy lifestyle. We live in an environment that promotes obesity. So who remembers when this came out? Coca-Cola did this. Share a Coke with your friend and then the Coca-Cola bottles had people's names on it and people were rushing to buy the Coca-Cola with their name on it. And then people, black people were upset when they couldn't find their name on it. Like, absolute foolishness, yeah? But this is the environment that we live in. Everywhere you look, you're getting an advertisement for something that's unhealthy, something that's high in fat, sugar, salt, yeah? These phones on silent. Everywhere you go, look at this. When you're going to a checkout, as you're checking out, what do you see on either side? Chocolate, Sweets, chocolates, and it's at whose eye line? The children's, the children's eye line, because they know when, once you get there, yeah, they're just gonna pester you and you're right there to check out, all right, go on, pick it up and you'll buy it, yeah? You're sitting down at a bus stop, you can't get away from this stuff, yeah? This is the environment that we live in. It's got so bad that they've got a technical term for it and they call it an obesogenic environment. An obesogenic environment is an environment that promotes obesity. An environment that promotes an unhealthy lifestyle. That's the environment that we live in, yeah? And this environment is powerful. Like, again, I like to use analogies. I call the environment so large. In other words, the environment goes around putting bread on its beef. <laughs> the environment doesn't need to, the environment's not touching us, but it's killing us, yeah? So this is the environment, the obesogenic environment. And this is how powerful the environment is. Even when we're trying to promote obesity and promote the, the dangers of obesity, this was by um, Cancer Research. They had an ad where they were trying to promote the dangers of um, childhood obesity. Watch this. That's the obesogenic environment. Like, yeah, whatever. Back to this, yeah? That's how powerful the environment is. Even when you're trying to promote it like something healthy, they're like, no, nah, man, we'll take over. All right, so when it comes to the children now, this is all I see when I'm in the schools. Their addictions, the food, they're not exercising anymore. They're always on their phones. Like, this is the obesogenic environment, yeah? And the obesogenic environment is not just marketing and advertising. The obesogenic environment is any part of the environment that stops us from eating healthy food or stops us from exercising. So you could argue that these things are part of the obesogenic environment because they're stopping the children from doing what they're supposed to be doing. Looking yeah, at a book. exactly. You should be looking at a book as opposed to looking at your phone. So this is part of the obesogenic environment. And because a lot of us, when we think of obesity, we'll think of the, um, we'll think of the individual. So if you were to split this up, into two, you could argue this is the individual. Individual. And this is the environment. Now, a lot of us, when we ask, when I go into the schools and I'm talking to the, the children about childhood obesity, I'm talking to the teachers. The teachers always say to me, why are you telling us this stuff? We know this stuff already. You need to be talking to the parents. It's the parents' fault that the child is overweight. It's the parents' fault that the child is obese. Well, the parent obviously has a responsibility, but look what the child is up against. The child is up against all of this stuff and this stuff as well, the environment as well. So we can't just blame the parent when the environment- the Teachers are in a position where they can teach these things as well. So they exactly, exactly, yeah. So how is this environment affecting us? Well, these are statistics from who? World Health Organization. World Health Organization. And according to the World Health Organization, one in three children are overweight or obese. One in three children in the UK are overweight or obese. That's a staggering number.
yeah? Now, when it goes to the adults now, when these children grow up, do you reckon that number gets better or worse? Worse. worse. So, for adults, two-thirds, two-thirds of adults in the UK are overweight or obese. This is coming from World Health Organization, yeah? And look at this. This was from BBC News. UK most overweight country in Western Europe. So we're the best. We're, we're winning. <laughs> we're, we're top of the top. Yeah. All right. So the obesogenic environment. Now, this is in your notes on page three. The obesogenic environment accounts for the wider influences on health and weight, requiring a move away from a more traditional understanding of obesity as primarily a self-determined state. So we need to start rethinking obesity as a normal response to essentially an abnormal environment. So I've written there on the board, the more you live in an abnormal environment, that should say, the more you'll think it's normal. So the more you live, the more you live in an abnormal environment, the more you'll start to think it's normal. And if our children are growing up in this obesogenic environment, they're going to start to think that the obesogenic environment is normal. So I've got there, the longer you live in an abnormal environment, the more you'll start thinking it's normal. Now, again, when I'm studying science and I'm teaching it to children. Yes. Exactly. Well, going back to the children, what do they do every day after school? They eat chicken and chips. They eat fried chicken. That is abnormal to eat fried chicken every day. But because we've been, the children have grown up in this abnormal environment, they think it's normal to leave school and go get fried chicken. It's normal for them. It would actually be odd for them not to do it, not to get fried chicken with their friends and go to the chicken shop and socialise in that. That would, just wouldn't make sense for them. So the fact that they're eating all of these red foods, the red foods now become the normal and the green foods become the abnormal. Now, here's an analogy. If you had a fish in a fishbowl and the fish was sick, what would you do? Would you treat the fish or would you change the water? Change the water. Change the water. Logic would say you should change the water because the fish is only going to be as healthy as the water is swimming in because the water becomes its environment, yeah? So if the fish is sick, we need to look at the water. But we live in a society that does what if the fish is sick? Treats the fish. If you're sick, what are we gonna do? We're gonna give you medication. That's treating the fish. If you're sick, what are we gonna do? We're gonna give you surgery. That's treating the fish. We're not looking at the environment. We're not looking at any of this stuff. We go straight to the individual. It's the individual's fault. But what about the environment that they're living in? Yeah? So if the fish is sick, you should change the water. Yeah? Now, you could think about this in your own little mini environments. So the macro environment, you might think to yourself, well, I'm not in control of the macro environment. But what about the mini environments? What environments are you in control of? Well, what about at home? You're in control of that environment. You're in control of what you put in your fridge. At school, that's a mini environment for your children. So that's the reason why I teach the teachers, because they're in control of that environment. And then at work as well. Me, I work at this university, so this is like a mini environment for me. 